stone a symbol of Jesus. How could that be? Can we take a look at the next picture? This is the first temple they built. You know what it means that Jesus was the perfect cornerstone? That stone that they first did not want because it was not perfect for what they thought they needed it, endured all kinds of weather, endured snow and cold and heat, and the rejection of the builders because they said this stone is no good. Christ endured all sorts of pains and hurts in his heart because the people who he came for rejected him. They said, this is not the Messiah. Do you remember how the people said Jesus was not the Messiah? And so in that way, they were, he was rejected just like that stone was rejected. But guess what? When he was sacrificed, when he died on the cross for me, that's when we discovered that he is the perfect cornerstone. That his sacrifice covered our sins and forgave us in a way that now you and I can go to heaven and meet him. Isn't that awesome? Today, I want to make an invitation to you. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are building your temple right now. And still, even adults continue to build on their temples. And listen to this. If you make Jesus the foundation of your heart, Mateo, of your character, of your mind, of your thoughts, if you pray, if you read the Bible, that's how you make Jesus the foundation of your heart, the foundation of your temple. And that will give you a solid foundation. And so if storms come, when the storms of life come, your house, your body, your mind will never crumble down like, this, like these houses that I'm going to show you right now. Look at those houses. When storms come, if the foundation is not strong enough, the houses will crumble down. But it's not going to happen if we make Jesus the cornerstone, the most important stone in our foundation. Would you like to invite Jesus to be the cornerstone of your life? We must read scripture together. We must pray. We must say, Jesus, I want you to be the foundation of my home. You need to say it. He wants to hear it. Okay, so when you pray, you pray that prayer. I want to show you the next picture. And I want to share a verse with you. I think you're old enough to listen to this verse and understand. This is a very, this is the reader's version of this verse. It says, Christ is the living stone. People did not accept him, but God chose him. God places the highest value on him. And you also are like living stones. That's to you and me. We are also like stones. As you come to Jesus, you're being built into a house for worship. And underneath it says, look, I'm placing a stone in Zion. It is a chosen and very valuable stone. It is the most important stone in the building. And the one who trusts in him will never, never, when? Never. When? Never. 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 Be put to shame. Never. All right? Let's pray about that. Would you like to pray, Matthew? Come. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day and that we have that we have a good day. And help us to invite you to our hearts and to our minds. And also, we will accept you as our cornerstone for the house. And Lord, help us to always help me, help my family, help everybody, and forgive everybody's sins for what they have done. And you know, and also that we pray that you also love us 
and we love you too. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mateo. Thank you, everyone. Good morning again and happy Sabbath. Now it's time for worship and giving. Today's loose offering will go to uh, Potomac Corners. And I will have something here that I would like to share with you very quickly. In the book of Desire of Ages, page 615, it says, It is the motive that gives character to our acts, stamping them with ignominy, or with high moral worth, not the great things which every eye sees and every tongue praises does God account most precious. The little duties cheerfully done, the little gifts which make no show and which to human eyes may appear worthless, often stand highest in his sight. A heart of faith and love is dearer to God than the most costly gift. The poor widow gave her living to the little that she did. She deprived herself of food in order to give two mites to the cause she loved. And she did, not, she did it in faith, believing that her heavenly father would not overlook her great need. It was this unselfish spirit and childlike faith that won the Savior's commendation. With those words, I will invite the deacons to stand up and let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings received this week, for work, for income, for roofs, for homes, for vehicles, for food, for health, and for all of the things that you provided for us, O oh Lord. At this time, we pray that in the same way we can freely and with joyful hearts, we can return what belongs to you and also give as gratitude, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, for being with us and for blessing us in such a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now it's time, church, for Garden of Prayer. This is the time that 
we come to the front with our petitions, with our praises. We thank God for the many things that he has done during the week. But also, we bring our hearts before him so he can listen to our prayers, our petitions, our needs. If you uh, cannot come to the front, you can just kneel with us where you are. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being with us, for providing, for your healing, for your mighty hand. Father, so many times we read in Scripture that the people of Israel turn away from you. But whenever they got in trouble, they looked up, they cried out loud to you. And in your infinite mercy, you delivered them over and over and over again. Father, we thank you for the example. We feel awful every time we fall. We come short. We fail you. And then we have to come before you and say, Lord, please forgive me for my sins and my shortcomings and give me another opportunity. However, we know, Father, that according to Paul, we have to fight this fight. And while we are here on this earth, we will go through temptations. We will go through difficulties. We will go through different experiences and scenarios and situations that perhaps they're going to bring the best out of us. But we know if that happens, is because in your perfect plan, you know that in your name, we can be overcomers. And Father, for that, we thank you. Right now, we know there are people in our church who are sick, who are desperate of your healing touch, who are desperate of feeling your hand in their shoulder so they can feel that you are with them and they don't feel alone. Father, we pray for every single person that is on our prayer list, for every single family represented here this morning, for our visitors, our guests, for those who are watching over the internet, for the kids who are singing here today. Father, let for them not be just singing songs, but an experience that will connect them directly with you. Father, in the same way, as they continue to participate and as we continue to be ministered this morning, may our hearts, our minds be connected to you, be in tune with you, and whatever distractions that we may have, O oh Lord, that we may be experiencing, O oh Father, take them away in Jesus' name and help us, Lord, to commit our thoughts, our attention, and our devotion to you during this hour. Father, we pray for the instrument that you have selected to deliver your message this morning. And we pray that the words that that instrument will be sharing, Father, will be what our hearts are in so much need. But Lord, we also pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us, not only throughout this, through this hour, but will be with us during the rest of this day and the rest of the week. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, for your unconditional love, and for every opportunity that you give us every single day. In Jesus' name, we pray and we thank you and we bless your holy name. Amen.
morning, church. Today I'm going to be reading Acts 3, 6 through 8. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I have none, but such as I have given I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, and he, and he, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And now we'll have a meditation uh, in music. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. For those of you that are visiting, I want to tell you a little bit about our group. It's called Bella Voce, which is Beautiful Voices. We started about three years ago when I started being the music teacher here. And what I've learned, hmm, okay, first I thought, I don't ever want to do this. What am I doing? Am I crazy? Which we all know I am. But I will tell you that I've learned so much from your children, from these children, who have become my children, which I love. Christian education. You know, when I was little growing up, I went to public school, and then I went to church school for academy years. And I went to a public college. And I see, keep finding my way back in Christian school. And what I've learned is that, you know, there's sacrifices that are made. It costs a lot of money. But the benefits are huge. And I know that you will hear, we have two of our members missing, Nyla Hawkins and Scarlett Castillo. They're both sick. Um, so we have eight voices, eight beautiful voices instead of ten. And we have had three weeks to learn the song. So I ask that the angels will sing with us and that you will get a blessing to go forth with song because song is the universal language. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Music can transcend any barriers. So I hope that you open your hearts and get a blessing today. Go forth with the song. 
I think I got that. Oh, I did get that turned on. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you. And stay. I want to put in a little plug for Saturday, April 4. I don't have my calendar. I live by a calendar, but if it's not in front of me, I'm lost. I want to put in a plug for April 4 for Potomac Conference Music Festival. Um, and you will get to hear more beautiful harmonies like that. And it will be held at Shenandoah Valley Academy. It's going to be choral and strings. And we're working on getting you the music. <laughs> we were late in the game in getting this organized this year. But um, that, was, that was beautiful. Thank you. OK. I'm sorry. I was looking through my notes downstairs. Um, before we get started, I gave some handouts to the deacons. So if there are any children that would like one, and I think I made about 50. So if there are children or adults, I have a handout. On one side, it's to do a tally of the number of times I say silver, gold, or the phrase, such as I have. On the back side, there are five points to today's sermon. So you can kind of follow where I am, and it's a fill in the blank for those points. At the end, um, when I'm back at the door, Allie Steiner has agreed to stand back there with me. And Allie, I gave them to Mrs. D. So if you can, oh, she gave them to you. All right, thank you. Who was it? Carl said efficient. Um, so if you don't have to give it to Allie, but if you'll show it to Allie, she has something to give you if you show her that you filled them out. So while they're handing those out, have you ever um, just found yourself in situations and the way it plays out, you just look up and you go, that was God. There's no way that wasn't God, how he just puts things together. I had a couple of those just yesterday. I was on the phone with Nana. And you know, when you talk to people that are just godly people, it rubs off on you. And I was talking to her about the sermon today. And there was a thought that just, there was this clarity. And I thought, that's it. That's what was missing. And that's because I was talking to Nana. I know it. While I was talking to Nana, a gentleman came up. I didn't hear him pull up in the driveway. And he said, um, the field behind our church, is that your field? Mm -hmm. Are those your cows? Uh-huh. Because I always know what the next comment's going to be. They're out. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So I finished my conversation with Nana. I called my husband. We got a plan of action. I go out to the truck because I keep my rain boots out in the truck. No matter where I'm going, I'll have them with me. And they're nice and tall. So when I'm walking through the briars, so I thought, OK, I'll get my boots. I'll go get a bucket of feed. They'll follow the feed, right? They will follow the food. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the truck. And um, he pulls back up in the driveway. He said, oops, my bad. When I was walking by, I didn't realize that your fence, and I said, does kind of a weird jog back there? He goes, yeah, they're inside your fence. You're fine. OK, but because I was sitting in the truck, I saw something in the door pocket that I thought I had lost two months ago. And I was so upset when I had lost it. It was something that a dear friend had given me and I was, I, I mean, when I realized I had lost this thing, I retraced my steps three times from the truck to the parking lot to my office at the conference office, back and forth. And I'm like, oh, man. And I saw it yesterday. And I'm like, Lord, had that guy not come and told me about the cows, I would not have been here. I would not have seen it. And it was, it just put this smile on my face. And I said, God, that's two. Within 10 minutes, you gave me two big ones. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have prayer. Father, thank you for being with us. We have invited you on more than one occasion, and we know you're here. You have allowed me to be your servant today. And there's a road map that I have, but Father, you're the driver. I pray that my lips are anointed for your words to come through, because this is your message, not mine. And I pray, as I always do, that when we leave this place, 
we will be changed because we've been in your presence and that others will know we have been in your presence. In your precious name we pray, amen. amen. Silver and gold. There's a lot of ways you can go with that sermon. And, um, and I had what I thought God was telling me. I, when James talked to me and asked if I would preach, let me think about it, let me pray about it. And, and I'd read something on the internet about um, gold, and it just it kind of clicked, and that title was there, and so it, w- it was coming together. And I kid you not, last week I'm driving home, and it was, I couldn't quite feel the touch, but I heard him very clearly say, that's not a bad sermon, but that's your sermon. You know that song that's been running through your head? And if you know this song, please join with me. Peter and John went to pray. They met a layman on the way. He held out his palm and asked for alms, and this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It's a simple song, right? And God's like, no, it isn't. That's what I want you to focus on. I really? And to use one of James's terms, he unpacked it this week. I kid you not. He just kept going deeper and deeper with me in this song. So let's take a closer look. Acts chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called, be- ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So we'll just kind of unpack it a a little at a time. And um, verse 1, Peter and John went together to the temple. Did you notice that, yes, they were going to the temple, but they were looking around them they were aware of the needs of the people around them. They were not so focused like those Le- the Levite and the priest from the story of the Good Samaritan. And I remember James sharing the story at Sabbath school last week, how he got off the train, headed to, we could, um, I always want to say we could prayer, heading to prayer meeting, and he saw a gentleman that he knew needed help. And he thought, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. But he... And the, I think the irony hit James, too. I'm on my way to prayer meeting. I can't stop to help somebody. But he knew he needed to do that. He made eye contact. The gentleman just needed to make a quick phone call. That was all he needed. He wasn't asking for money, any other handouts or anything. Peter and John are on their way to the temple, and they're not so focused on God's mission that they neglect the mission field. They are looking around, and they see that need. And... You know, I turn this at myself. I'm really good at thinking that I'm doing God's mission, but how often do I neglect his mission field because I'm so busy doing his mission? And if I'm doing his mission and neglecting the mission field, then I'm not doing his mission. And it's an easy trap to get caught up in. Verse 2. Um, it says that, and a certain lame man from, 
a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the temple. There's a lot in this verse. Uh, we know that he was over 40 because chapter 4, verse 22 tells us that he was 40 plus years old. And he's at the gate, um, and it's gate beautiful. So I, I would tend to think it probably has some gold or silver decorations. It may not have been solid gold, but there's a reason it was beautiful. So I'm sure it was very decorative and probably had gold. But you know what really got me? He was outside the church. Why was he outside? He couldn't walk in. His friends didn't take him in. But honestly, would he have been accepted inside the church? Uh-uh. He'd been cursed since the day he was. Everybody around said, you're lame, have been lame since your mother's womb. You're cursed. And you know what really hit me? How many times who do we prejudge and say, uh-uh, you can't come in the church. We are pushing you aside. Nope, you're not welcome here. The divorcees, the addicts, the homeless, the people that don't dress very nice, that don't smell very nice. It just, it so struck me yesterday when I was talking with Nana. He was outside the church because he never would have been welcomed inside the church. Not that he couldn't get here, but he wouldn't have been welcomed. Mrs. White, in um, Acts of the Apostle, page 57, she says that his goal was to see Jesus because he wanted to be healed. And by the time his friends made it and got him to the temple, Jesus had already been crucified. So this man is outside the temple. As far as he knows, his hope is gone. And he has been publicly shamed. He is not welcome. He's been disenfranchised, for, for lack of a better term. And point number one, don't leave them at the gate. Bring them in. Do not leave these disenfranchised at the gate. Bring them in. Don't invite them in. I mean, yes, invite them. And I don't mean bring them in kicking and screaming, but it's not just extending that invitation. It is whatever we can do to bring them in. Because this, Johnny, what is the phrase that you have, I've heard you use for years about this church? In the community, it should be, There you go. That's our mission. Anybody that comes on this property, not just inside the church, but on this property, is so loved and so cared for, they can't stay away. That is what we need to do. So don't leave them at the gate. Bring them in. And to finish verse 2 and verse 3, it says that he's asking for alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And you know what? It says that he saw Peter and John. Didn't say that he made eye contact with them. It just said that he saw them. And I want to go back a minute to the alms. When I looked up alms, um, I got a new Bible that has like a strong concordance in the back. It's really cool. I love it. And it said alms was charity or pity. He's asking for charity. He's asking for pity. He's asking for money. He's asking for a temporary fix because nobody can fix him. But they can give him something. Maybe they'll give him a shawl. Maybe they'll give him shoes, money, food. But nobody can fix him. So whatever he's getting is a temporary fix. And it said that he saw Peter and John, but it didn't say he made eye contact because where was he looking? He's cursed. Is he going to make eye contact with anybody? No, he's looking down. He is discouraged. He is depressed. The one person that he thought could heal him is dead. He has been rejected from society. 
It doesn't mention his family. It says they. So we have to assume those are friends, not family. He's not married. Who would marry him? He is lonely, as my friend Judy said. He is lonely on so many levels. But he's here in front of the temple where people will throw him money. And, you know, for some people it's a good show. Oh, look, I did my good deed. I, I gave money to this poor beggar over here. But that's all it is. You're giving money. There's no connection. It's just you're giving. But then it says at the rest of verse 4, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Did you get that? Fixing his eyes on him. Peter sees him. Peter's not looking past him. He's not just throwing a coin and going his way. Peter sees him. He sees the man's situation. He does not see the man's curse. He sees the man's situation. And then Peter says, look up. Look at us. Look up. And it reminded me of the verse in Psalms. Psalms 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Peter said, look up. What if the man hadn't looked up? What would he have missed out on? Point number two, look up. Shift your perspective. When I sat in the truck yesterday, changing my boots and all that, my perspective had changed. Because I opened the door to that truck, I can't tell you how many times a week, but I'm at a different perspective. When I was sitting up there and I looked down, what had been lost was now found. Shift your perspective. Don't keep looking at your situation. Don't keep looking at your problems. Look up. What's the song? Look up. Redemption draweth nigh. He looked up expectantly. When we look up to God, shouldn't we be looking up expectantly? What better place to look than him? So we need to look up at him expectantly. I told you, there's a lot in this story that we've heard since we were kids. And God's like, oh, but there's so much more. Look deeper. So he looked up. He shifted his perspective. And now he's wondering, okay, he's expecting. You know, are they, are they going to give me money? Are they going to throw me a coin? Well, if I'm lucky. But is there going to be ridicule? Scorn? Derision? It wouldn't be the first time. When people look to us, and they look at us expectantly. You're a Christian. What are they getting from us? Are we helping to shift their perspective to God? Or are we just, yep, yeah, here we go again, hearing the same old thing. Yeah, I know. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do. What are they hearing from us? Are we offering them something to be looking up to? So now he's waiting. And verse 6 says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. 6a. So Peter looks at him and says, I don't have any gold or silver. Okay, well, it's not like he was expecting gold or silver. I mean, who would? A copper, a coin of some kind? But Peter says, I don't have that. So disappointed yet again. Okay, well, like I said, what else is new? But, and that all important, but, because what does that mean? It means wait. Something else is coming. Peter knew that silver and gold were just valuable here on earth. But he knew the place where that won't matter. Because you think about it, in heaven... What is silver and gold used for? Paving. Silver and gold is paving material in heaven. He knew that. He wanted to offer this man 
something better than paving material. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope I'm on the right track. <laughs> such as I have give I thee. Such as I have? Such as I have? Really? You asked me to make eye contact with you for you to tell me you don't have anything to give me, but you don't have silver or gold to give me, but such as I have? And he's waiting because what could they have to offer him that's better than silver or gold? He's a beggar. What could be better than you fixing the temporary, this need that I have temporarily? You, you threw out silver and gold. What do you have that could be better than that? And last week when I was looking this up, as I said, I was planning to go another direction with the silver and gold. As of last week, silver was $18.06 an ounce. It's not bad. Gold was $1,500 plus per ounce. And palladium was $1,600 plus per ounce. And Peter is saying, I don't have that, but such as I have give I thee, Peter had something better to offer. We have something better. This man had no idea what was about to happen to his life. He had no idea that such as I have meant something better, such as I have meant I've got a permanent fix to your problem. John chapter 4, verses 9 through 15. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Jesus had something better. He had something better to offer her. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But such as I have, I've got something better. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give them will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman looked to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Point number three. Such as I have equals something Oh, I know you heard me. Something better. Such as I have meant something better. Everything that you could possibly want, everything that could ever be offered to you is offered to you through Christ. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. I've got something better for you living water, an everlasting, permanent solution. And then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of, Lazar of Nazareth. I always get, <laughs> there's a rhyme there. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They didn't say it in their name. They didn't invoke themselves, look at me. They pointed right back to the power of everything, the power of the universe, that something better is the power of the universe at your hand, who wants to be right, right here inside you. And the beggar knew that name. The beggar knew the name of Jesus. He, 
They definitely have his attention now. Peter takes him by the right hand. I don't know the significance of the right hand, but I do know the significance of the beggar accepting the hand that was proffered to him. Because when he accepted that hand, he was lifted out of a life of muck and mire. His life completely changed. Talk about a paradigm shift. You were taken to the temple that morning as you were every day for how many years, reaching out and asking for a crumb from somebody who thought of you as worthless and cursed. And two poor men looked you in the eye and said, I can't help you temporarily, but I can give you a permanent fix. Take my hand. And point number four, take the out stretched hand. When you take that hand, you are offered a complete paradigm shift. You are offered to be taken out of the muck and mire of sin, out of all that stuff that just, we shouldn't be going to heaven. We have no business even thinking we can be in heaven. But Jesus offered us something better when he died on the cross. And he said, take my hand. Take that gift. I want to give it to you. I won't force it on you, but it's here. Take my hand. Let me, let me lift you up out of this. And the Sabbath school lesson this week, page 110 the work which the disciples did, we are also to do. Every Christian is to be a missionary. In sympathy and compassion, we are to minister to those in need of help, seeking with unselfish earnestness to lighten the woes of suffering humanity. We are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort the suffering and afflicted. We are to minister to the despairing and to inspire hope in the hopeless. And that man was hopeless. And they said, take my hand. There is um, a song by, I remember first hearing the song by the group Avalon back in the 90s, Renew Me. And I, I've always liked the song, but I just heard it a couple weeks ago by the Heritage Singers. And there was just something about the way Shaney sang that song that hit me. And I, I kid you not, I've been listening to that song probably every day and hitting repeat. Listen to these words. Why am I such a dusty window for your light to shine through? Why am I just a tiny star in a sky already blue? This would really hit me. Why do I offer everything with my heart like a fist. Oh, I want to love you better than this. Why do I live like I'm in chains when you have set me free? And why do I have to break your heart before I fall to my knees? I know it's time to pray for change, give all I have to give. I want to love you better than this. I need you as my refuge, my first and last resort. Be the river always running through my deepest thoughts. Keep me in your arms, because even when I drift, I want to love you better than this. So renew me, remake me, undo me, unbreak me. Come into the empty spaces of my broken places and consume me, complete me, pursue me, Redeem me. Let your Holy Spirit living through me renew me. I am telling you, wow, did that song hit me. And I think of this man, this beggar, who has this hand offered to him. And if he will take that hand, God is going to renew him. We are that beggar. We are stuck in our ways. We are stuck in sin. It's all we've ever known. But he says, I want to change that. 
I'm, I'm pursuing you because I want to renew you. Let me in. And so, as I said, point four is take that outstretched hand. And he took it. And what does it say in verse eight? So he, leaping up. Was there some faith going on there? There was some faith. This man has never walked a day in his life, and he didn't just slowly get up. I hurt my foot a few weeks ago, and I got the KT tape on it. I went to the podiatrist for a follow-up visit, and he goes, it's pretty bad when we have to be duct taped together. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. I'm not leaping. I'm slowly moving because it hurts. He didn't slowly move. He leapt up. That's faith. Legs that had never worked are now leaping. And he entered the temple. The place that he's been kept out of, he's now going in there. And he's not sneaking in. He is leaping and praising God. You know what? He knew what Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 3. To know the love of Christ, verse 19, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, he may have dreamt of healing, but I don't think he ever imagined that it was going to happen. And he now knows he has experienced that joy because he took that hand that was offered him. His life was changed, and he now understands and is experiencing that joy that is above anything he ever could have imagined. And Jesus says, I have that for you. I have that for you. So this is why he's leaping. He wasn't just healed physically. It went deeper. He was healed, healed spiritually. And it doesn't matter. Well, let me, I'm ahead of myself. Jesus saw him. Didn't see his infirmity. Didn't see a curse. Peter and John did not see a curse. They saw a man. They saw a need. They didn't reject him. They treated him and talked to him as one who was worthy to be spoken to. One who was worthy to be seen, one who was worthy to be redeemed because they had been redeemed. Not because Peter and John were worthy, not because that man was worthy, not because we're worthy, but because Jesus said, I love you. And because I love you, you're worth it in my sight. When he went into the temple... All the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew it was he who sat begging, at the alm, begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And I wondered, were they amazed because they'd written this guy off? And now here he is in the temple and he's changed and I had to ask myself, who are the people that I've written off, that I've prejudged? I may have written them off, but God didn't. He told Samuel, you're looking for a king, and you're looking here, but I see here. We only see the temporary, but God sees the permanent. Point number five our job is to love, not judge. God is the judge, not us. Our job is not to offer the world silver and gold. Our job is not to offer the world a temporary fix. Our job is to reach out that hand 
and offer them something better because silver and gold is worth zero zip, zilch, nada. We are not to offer them paving material, but we are to offer them living water. We are to offer them something better. We need to offer them, I need to offer them everything in him. stand still doing that because Kathy didn't know. But that was the perfect song. Take it to the Lord in prayer. He's going to reach out to us, shield us, protect us when we've been despised and rejected. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you promised. Thank you for what you've given. Thank you for who you are and for reaching into the muck and mire of where we are and saying, I have something better. Please just take my hand and let me give it to you. And I pray we will take that gift you have offered us. 
the gift of your son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated and let's wait for the deacons to dismiss you. God bless.